this commandment, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God. I can tell you all that all day long. But have we decided to love Him with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds? Nothing should stir our emotions like God. Nothing should stir our emotions like God. There shouldn't be anything else that stirs our emotions like God. Chapter number 20, verse number 1. 
And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. God spoke to Israel and God <clears throat> proclaimed to them that he was, in verse number one, the Lord their God that had brought them out of the house of bondage and out of, out of the land of Egypt. That verse number one, that verse number one is an interesting verse because not only does God want to bring us out of the house of bondage, he wants to bring us out of the land of Egypt. He's just not content with bringing us out of a house that has bondage. He wants to bring us in out of the land of Egypt. And I believe he wants to take us to that land that David spoke about, the land of the living. I don't want to be in the land of Egypt. I don't want to be in the world with its messed up values. I don't want to be in the world with its messed up systems. I want to be in the house of God. I want to be in the true land of the living this morning. He said, I am the Lord your God. Wasn't a suggestion. Wasn't something for them to debate. And then he gave a commandment. You're to have no other gods before me. And not only are you not only to have no other gods before you, you are not to engrave, create, build, construct any images to any other God, to bow down to them, nor to serve them. And then he gave the reason for it. He said, I am a jealous God. Did he not? He said, I am a jealous God. You ever, you ever seen a jealous person? You ever seen a jealous wife? You ever seen a jealous man? Have you ever been around someone who perceived that someone else was trying to get the affections? of their mate. You ever seen it? It's not such a, uh, listen, it's not the wind blowing in daisies time, all right? It's not, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it's something to see the jealousy because that person loves that individual so much that they don't want anything taking affection away. And so it burns, it burns like a fire. You ever thought about God being a jealous God? He said he was a jealous God. He said, I am, I'm, I'm jealous over you. I, I don't want your affections going any other place but to me. Now we understand something today that when God gives us a commandment, although it may look like on the surface it's negative, we must understand that every commandment God has is, for, is good for us. It's something good for us. For example... To have no other gods before me. Well, number one, there is no other God but him. He declared that all through the scriptures. There's no other gods. So when he says have no other gods, he's really saving us and protecting us from worshiping things that cannot hear, cannot speak, cannot deliver, cannot help. To have another God is to believe that a rabbit's foot will bring you good fortune. To have another God is to believe you can pick up a four-leaf clover and it's going to be your lucky day. To have another God other than Jesus is to believe that it's bad luck. It may not be a good safety measure, but to, to have another God is to believe it's bad luck to walk under a ladder. 
To have another God other than Jesus is to believe that if a window closes automatically in your home, that that means that uh, somebody's going to die soon. Never mind that the window pane may be loose. It just means that somebody may die soon in that home. You see, all of that is superstition. All of that doesn't have anything to back it up. But He is the true God. He is the only God. So when He said, don't have any other gods before me, He was really saying, save yourself from a lot of vanity. Save yourself from a lot of wasted time. Just keep me at the very front of your life and have no other gods. Don't make any graven images. If you do, you waste your time and your money. Right? I don't want you wasting your time or your money. If you do that, if you make graven images, you're praying to a God that doesn't exist and you're wasting your time and you're wasting your money. And then he goes down to say, he goes down to say, he says, if you would bow down and you would serve them, if you would bow down and you would serve them, I believe it is in, it is in verse number uh, five. He said, don't bow down. Don't bow thyself down to them nor serve them. For I'm a jealous God. He said, if you, if you would bow down and serve them, he says, I visit iniquity. I visit iniquity. And when I visit iniquity, what a father or a mother will bow down and serve other, other than God, bow down and serve, has the way of getting in the generations of their descendants. He said, he said that he would visit the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. In other words, when we don't follow God's pattern, we don't follow God's pattern, we put things in our sons' lives and our daughters we put things in our grandchildren's lives and our great-grandchildren's lives and our great-great-grandchildren's lives that God would have to visit them. Now, God would not visit them for my sin because God only requires that, that, that as a man sins, he stands for his own sin. But sin is so powerful that the actions of a father are many, 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 many times carried out in a son and in a grandchild and in a great-grandchild. And this is, can be proven by my statistics because they show many times that alcoholics and drug abuse, they'll find when they begin to, when they begin to, to, to list it, my dad was an alcoholic. His dad was an alcoholic. His dad's dad was an alcoholic. And he goes all the way back. So I want to be very careful today in my actions because what I do has a way of influencing and directing my children and the same punishment that God would put upon me for my iniquities could be placed on my children. And I don't want to do that. But watch the mighty power of grace this morning. He said if you do bow down to them, and you do worship them, that sin has an effect to the third and fourth generation. But then it says, and showing mercy, verse 6, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and that keep my commandment. Thousands. Look at the power of grace. Sin has an effect upon the third to the fourth generation. But let a person embrace the true God let a person really embrace the true God. And it has a way of not only affecting just three or four generations, God said it has a way of affecting thousands of generations. In other words, there's no end to a godly example. Give me a godly man that, that walks the walk and talks the talk. Give me a godly woman that walks the walk and talks the talk. Give me a godly marriage, a godly couple. And I'll show you somebody that their influence can influence generations yet to come. As a matter of fact, there was a young man. There was a young man. He wasn't doing real good himself spiritually. And he alone did not deserve this. But God moved in this young man's life and told the prophets, 
you tell him that he's getting this today because of the sure mercies of David. You tell him he's getting this today because of King David. Now the most interesting thing, King David lived about 700 years before that descendant was ever born. But 700 years later, God was still looking down trying to find people of the descendants of David to say, you know what, I'm going to move in your life because of 700 years ago, your, your forefathers, they had a love for God's house, they had a love for God's word, and I'm going to do something for you. I don't know about you, but that's exactly the kind of example that I want to be because we really don't know how long it's going to be before the Lord comes. That's the kind of example. So today... As we're studying about idolatry, it's interesting that we would take this turn. But go with me to the book of Mark, chapter number, chapter number 12 of the book of Mark, verse number 29. Now Jesus, or 28, excuse me. Now Jesus was always trying to be entrapped by the religious people, either the Pharisees or the Sadducees or... Uh, he was trying to be entrapped by them. They tried to catch him in some kind of inconsistency, and he was all. And this was at the end of one of these such talks. And the Sadducees that actually came and that actually came and uh, they said this. They said, uh, "Jesus, if a man has a wife and they have no children, and he dies, and they have no children." And his brother marries her. And he dies. And they have no children. And the third brother marries her. And he dies. And they have no children. He goes all the way down to the seventh brother. Four, five, six, seven. All seven of them marry the same woman. And all seven of them had no seed. In the resurrection, Jesus, whose wife will she be? Well, he said, you do err because you don't know the scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, there's no, no marriage, no given in marriage. So he had answered them, he had answered them well. And the Bible says in verse 28, this is right after this had happened. And one of the scribes came and having heard them reasoning together and perceiving that he had answered them well, asked him, which is the first commandment of all? He was impressed with how Jesus answered him. And then he took an opportunity, he said, I'd like to know the very first commandment of all. Jesus answered him, The first of all the commandment is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's the first commandment. And you know why it's the first? Because Jesus said it was the first. That ends it right there. He said it's the first, makes it the greatest. You've got to start with the first. So we're not on a, we're not on a hobby horse today. We're not on some kind of a denomination, denomination uh, 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 lollipop today. The first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Keeps us out of idolatry, doesn't it? Keeps us out of looking for anything else. When we just understand up front, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Now, that, that takes care of idolatry because you don't want to bow down to anything else or serve anything else or engrave anything or build anything because there is only one God, one Lord. But verse 30, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. Now let's break the first commandment down for a moment. The first commandment not only has a fact that there's only one God, but the first commandment also carries a command for a proper response that there's only one God. 
You can't just hear the first commandment that there's one God and have a ho-hum attitude. Because to have a ho-hum attitude that there's only one God is to absolutely break the very first commandment. No wonder things don't work for some people because they don't even get started good. Because you have to love the Lord your God. This is a response. This is a response back to the first commandment. We're not done yet. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. It's not period there. It's not over. That's only part one of the first commandment. The rest of it is, and you need to respond. And you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. You're to put everything in it. You're to put everything it is to alter. It is to alter the way that you live your life. You can't say that you believe in one God and it not alter your life. You, you really don't believe in one God if it doesn't alter your life. You would fit more in the category with the devil because the devil believes in one God and trembles. You would be more in that category. But to believe there's one God and not do anything about it, you're not believing. But to truly obey the scripture, you have to decide, all right, I'm going to love this one God with all my heart. I'm going to love because love is not a feeling. I, I get so tired of people talking about I fell in love and I fell out of love and, and all this. Love is a decision that you make. Love is a decision. I'm attracted to God. I am attracted to God. He attracted you and I. When we were in our sins, when we were going about our merry way, he came down and attracted us. He came down and began to deal with us. He began to let us know it wasn't, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't us that decided, man, things are going crummy. I think I'll turn toward the church. It was God's presence that came to the hell hole you were living in. It was God's presence that came down in your life and began to quicken the thoughts of your mind that there's got to be a better way. And when he attracted me to him and when he brought when he brought me to him in his attractiveness and I saw I'm tired of living this ugly life. I'm tired of living this bondage life. I'm tired of feeling like trash. I'm tired of feeling this way. I made a decision to repent. I made a decision to be baptized. I made a decision to seek the Holy Ghost. I made a decision to live for God. Can I tell you something? God didn't suck my brains out of my head when I got the Holy Ghost. God didn't suck all my will out of me. We're not robots. We're not programmed robots. I made a decision to go to the altar. Just like when I got attracted to my wife at the Shoney's, the old Shoney's. Now, now you all say all of them's old right now. Well, there was a day in this town when we had an old Shoney's and a new Shoney's. The old Shoney's was out on Alcoa Highway and the new Shoney's was, was on 129, right up here on 321, excuse me, right up here, that was, the new, that was the new Shoney's. But when I saw my wife for the first time at the old Shoney's, I was attracted to her. Sister Arwood's here, she was with me, her and her husband. I was attracted to her. Brown hair, blue eyes, tan, I was, that's her I'm talking about, I was attracted to her. But it didn't stop there. I made a decision to find out her name. I made a decision to get to know her. I made a decision to get around her. I made a decision to ask her out on a date. I made a decision to ask her to be my girlfriend. I made a decision to ask her to be my wife. I made a decision to get married. I made a decision to stay married. And I made this, it, it's all about making decisions. It's about making decisions, right? So this commandment, hero is of the Lord our God is one God. I can tell you all that all day long. But have we decided to love him with all of our hearts, all of our souls, all of our minds? Nothing should stir our emotions like God. Nothing should stir our emotions like God. There shouldn't be anything else that stirs our emotions like God. He said, um, you got to love me with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, is like namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
This is, there is none other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said unto him, Well, Master, thou hast said the truth. For there is one God, and there is none other but he. And to love him with all the heart and with all, all the understanding and with all the soul and with all the strength and to love his neighbor as himself is more than the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Man, he said, to do what you just said, to, to know there's one God, and to love him with all your heart, and to love your neighbor as yourself, he said, that's more than the Old Testament sacrifices put together. That's more than whole burnt offerings. That's more than all the drink offerings, the meal offerings, the festive days, all of the hem on the end of the garments. That's more than everything that the law could entail. That is more than all. Listen to what Jesus says. And when Jesus saw that he answered discreetly, he said unto him, Thou art not far from the kingdom of God. And no man after that durst ask him any questions. Wait a minute. I'm not far from the kingdom of God? That's exactly right. Do you know that to know that there's only one God and to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and to love your neighbor as yourself do you know, Sister Franklin, that when a person knows that, he's not far from the kingdom of God? He said, you're, you're not far away from my kingdom. But now we don't want to deal with being close because when it comes to God, almost in is always out. You can't almost make it to heaven. You've got to get all the way there. All right? You can't be like the guy in the book of Acts that said, almost you persuade, persuade me to be a Christian. You, you don't need to have a, I almost got there because almost right is always wrong. Almost in is always out. So I don't want to be almost there. So how I'm not far from the kingdom of God, that's right because you know this. But what will get you in the kingdom of God is to do this. That's why the scripture says don't be a hearer of the word only, deceiving yourselves but be a doer of the word. Don't just, don't just know that there's one God and you should love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Do it. Do it. What does it entail? It entails you deciding, I'm going to sing. The next time they get up and lead in singing, I'm going to look up there and sing the words. I'm going to clap my, I'm going to fight distraction. I'm going to fight standing here and thinking, are we going to get in, out in time to beat the Baptist to the restaurant? I'm going to stand here and I'm going, to, I'm going to fight off what am I going to do tomorrow. I am not going to have my checkbook in my hand, uh, balancing my checkbook while pastor's teaching. I am not going to be texting around on the bottom here. I'm not going to be texting to see. I'm going to love God with all my soul, mind, and strength. It, I'm going to turn my cell phone off. I'm going to turn everything off because I don't want to give God part of me. I want to give God every bit of me. And now he says, now you're coming on into the kingdom. Now you're coming on in. Come on into the kingdom. For more information about the Apostolic Connection or First Apostolic Church of Maryville, Tennessee, visit our website at factv.org.